Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Clark. Uh, I work for New Relic. I'm a software architect. Um, previously worked on the Ruby agent team, so I love Ruby. It is my favorite language. And I'm here tonight to talk to you uh, a little bit about uh, Ruby marshalling. And the, the subtitle to this talk that I, I edited out here was uh, How Much Hack Could a Hacky Hack Hack If a Hacky Hack Could Hack Hack. <laughs> um, this is a story about some interesting code that I ended up uh, putting into production in our code base. Uh, and we'll step through why that happened. So the backdrop for this was uh, New Relic runs a lot of Ruby applications. We have a long history with, with Ruby. And one of our big applications was on Rails 2.3. And this was a couple of years ago. And we were working on upgrading it to 3.2. Um, I got tapped in as kind of a, a help to the project for a couple of months. I took some pictures um, along the way of what the project was going like and you know how that upgrade felt for us. Um, there were a lot of a lot of issues. It was a rough road uh, getting from two three all the way to three two. But I'm going to talk about one of the last bugs that we hit, one of the last big things. But I want to set the stage for how this works. And there's a couple of moving parts in Rails that you need to understand for uh, the hack to really make sense. So we're going to work through a couple of these real quick. The first one is sessions in Rails. So HTTP, by its nature, is stateless. It doesn't persist anything across the requests that are sent across the wire. You just send a request to ask for things. And that's kind of a big problem. Like, if your browser made you log in every single time you wanted a new web page, that would really suck. So there's a system that browsers use to communicate with servers called cookies. A cookie is a text-based blob of kind of key value pairs that the browser and the server send back and forth every time a request and a response moves back and forth across the internet. So there are a couple of different ways that you can structure this to get your sessions. One of them would be to just put a session ID into your cookie and then on the back end behind your server run some sort of database, some uh, Redis or something that would have all of those sessions and that has all the data that you want associated with that user for them having logged in. And you know, you just keep it by ID. Now, this requires you to have all of those resources on your server side that you're maintaining. You have that database. You hold on to all of that data. An alternative way of storing this session information is to just cram it all into the cookie. Now, this has some downsides, um, as we will see. Um, some of them include you know, the size of the cookie can get very large. You don't have control over the data because it's in cookies sitting in the user's browsers. Um, but this is something that you can do. And for good or ill, way back when, when uh, New Relic was setting up some of our first Ruby apps, we chose in cookie sessions. I'm looking at Brent. He might have, no, he, he I don't know. <laughs> that, that, that creates that, 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 I recall back in the day. Way easier than doing database access. So uh -huh. It was easier. See, that's a really good engineering reason to choose a particular technology. Like that totally is valid. So well, I, I think also cookies are tasty. They, they are. Cookies are delicious. <laughs> to be clear, all of the cookies in this presentation are chocolate chip cookies. If they look like there's raisins in them, they're not. Like that's a terrible thing to do to somebody. Um, <laughs> All right, so the data that you put into these cookies um, has to be stored in some format that you can read it back out. So, you know, there's a variety of ways that you might do this. JSON, popular web standard, definitely a valid way to, uh, to store this sort of arbitrary data that you're looking for. YAML is a very Ruby-ish format to be storing data in. You know, even XML, you know, maybe you could get away with that. That's, that's pretty webbish if you're, you know, from the right era, you know, J2E being, no. <laughs> Nothing. Okay, so the other option is Ruby marshalling. Ruby marshalling. So what is Ruby marshalling? This turns out to be the format that um, up until 4.1, Rails used as the default for serializing into cookies. And it is supported by uh, the Ruby, Ruby core. And what you do is you take any Ruby object and you can call marshal dump on it, and it will provide you with a string that is a bunch of sort of, you know, semi-binary data and some recognizable stuff in there. And that value can be loaded back in and will rehydrate into an object that looks the exact same as what you had dumped out. Now, 
you can do this with basically any Ruby object, any nested set of Ruby objects that walks those relationships. Uh, it doesn't like cycles, but otherwise it's very powerful for being able to just take the state of a whole object graph and just spit it out. Now, there are some interesting corners around this Ruby marshalling though. So, we saw before an object, if we have an object that we derive from one of Ruby's core classes, like hash or string, um, we can, you know, marshal that out, everything's fine, but there is something that's a little different. You'll notice that there's this C and O. Now, I, I don't know precisely what that means, I haven't read the Ruby source, but this, this will be pertinent in a couple of minutes. But for now, let's just imagine all of these browsers out in the wild, with all of these cookies, with all of this binary Ruby Marshall data sitting in those cookies, just waiting to send it back to us and have us try to rehydrate that into a Ruby object. Well, this brings us to the next piece of our puzzle, and that is Flash. I mean, everybody's, everybody's familiar with Flash? Yes, in web development? No, not that sort of Flash. The Flash I'm talking about is Flash messages in Rails, where you take a controller action and then you redirect somewhere, and on that redirect, you want to show a message. And so this is a message that says, hey, your create action worked. Here's the, the link to the thing. Well, because HTTP is stateless, getting that information from the first request, the controller, to the next one, it has to get persisted into the session. So this is mediated by a class in Rails called Flash Hash. And this takes alert and warning messages and various other things and puts them into your session. And then when your next uh, controller action renders, it'll pull the stuff out and show it to you the way that you would expect. So our Flash is getting stuck into our cookie. Now, there's some interesting things about this flash hash, and some of this was our own doing. In an earlier Rails upgrade, we had muddled with things a little bit, but what we were ending up with was these flash hashes getting serialized down fully into the session. Now, between Rails 2.3 and 3.2, the Rails developers made a very reasonable choice. It's kind of bad practice to derive from the core built-in Ruby classes for reasons we can talk about at length later. So they changed the base class for flash hash from deriving from hash to just being an object that looked like a hash. Seems like a reasonable enough change. But unfortunately, this was the source of great terror for us in our upgrade. And we'll take a look quick at why. So we were almost at the point of getting ready to roll out our release. We canaried this thing out, so we said, hey, let's upgrade one of our servers in staging so it runs the new version. You would make a request from your browser. It would get handled by a server that was running Rails 2.3. That would serialize that flash hash derived from hash into our cookie, and then subsequently pass that cookie to a server running Rails 3.2. The Rails 3.2 server would try to rehydrate that object, and it would very cunningly tell us, dump format error. The session was not even able to load. The request would go just and completely tank when it hit this second server. Now, through a variety of means, um, you know, this is how we felt about it at the moment. It's sort of demoralizing. We're almost on the verge of rolling it out, and things are broken badly. But we found a way to triumph through it. Through a variety of other shenanigans that I could talk to you about if you wanted later, um, we managed to get a rescue block wrapped around the piece of code that actually did our martial loading. And this is the point that that martial load is the line that's going to fail for us. It's going to raise that argument exception. So what do we do if we get into this state? Our session's corrupted. We can't even proceed. We don't have any way of dealing with that. Well, you know, we could have invalidated the session, just logged people out, kicked them, uh, kicked them to the curb and told them to log in again, but that seemed really mean. So we tried to do a little better. The key thing to note was that the class name for the flash hash is there in this string that we're getting back from the session. And it's just a Ruby string. And there's interesting things you can do to strings in Ruby. So what we did is we created a class that's shaped like the old form of the data that still derives from a hash. 
called this the flash bash instead of flash hash. Turns out you have to make the names the same length or this trick doesn't work. <laughs> then we went and we took, and when we had the failure, we would look in that serialized blob of goo, we would replace flash hash with flash bash, which still looks like a hash, responds to all the right methods, has all the stuff that we need, and then we would just marshal load that. It would load our object up, everything was happy, and life proceeded on from there. So don't do this. Like, <laughs> this is a really bad idea. I, I love this trick, and it's great that it allowed us to get past a hurdle. But I do think that it is a, a very clear case of, you know, Ruby has an amazing amount of flexibility and an amazing way of uh, causing you problems and then giving you the tools to solve them. Thank you. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it seemed like something where we were, we were bashing something. I don't know. That just seemed like the operative word in, in the trick. Right. Yes. <laughs> that was for sure. All right. So I don't have a lot of fear of the next version because there's kind of two options. The class is either derived from one of the core types or it's not. And they've already changed that once. So I don't think they're going back. So I feel pretty good about that. Um, we are in the process of removing this. Like past a couple of months, the cookies all would have expired that would have had these sorts of problems for us to be concerned about. So we're still, we're going to remove it. It's, uh, we're just going to make sure that we're not hitting any, any more edge cases with it. So it really was a temporary measure to kind of get us through this transitional period. We got a little lucky, but it wasn't that much luck. So I think that the staging cluster that we were running in only had like three instances. And so we replaced one of them with the new version. So there was a pretty high percentage of things that you would end up on one and then on the other. Um, so we weren't specifically testing for it, but it did show up very quickly. It was like we, we booted the thing, we went around and just started like working through a couple of pages, submitting a couple of things, and then just catastrophic failure. Um, so it was, yeah, it was a bit of work to debug, but uh, we, we were not smart enough to see it ahead of time, but we figured it out once we tripped over it. Yes. was then creating, was making a hash of what the information you had before for the message. Mm -hmm. But in the three two, they went to some way that was still calling it a slash hash, but didn't actually make a hash, right? It was, it was still hash shaped. Okay. So it supported all of the main methods and things that a hash would. It just delegated it to an underlying hash rather than deriving directly from hash. Okay. So the, the two versions, like the objects looked identical from an exterior perspective unless you happen to like marshal the contents of it out. Now the, the particular thing you were saying like how it was um, it had to be the exact same length. Yes. What was is that related to the fact that like that that message is kind of like a blob of binary? 
Yeah, so the, the Ruby marshalling format you'll find in a number of other things. If you try these sorts of tricks like, oh, rename instance variables or rename classes, um, a lot of the format is length prefixed. So it has a number right before it that says how long the following string is that it's going to be reading out. And so that was the case with the class. And so like I did an earlier attempt at the, like when I figured out what the problem was, I was like, oh, I'll just make a totally different class or just like try to splice hash in there instead. And it just totally refused to work and eventually stumbled on the fact that it was sensitive to that length because of the encoding scheme. Yes, I imagine that it would have been. Um, we would have potentially been able to write something that would scrape through and fix all of them, or we may have been more apt to be willing to like hit the switch and um, just you know nuke all of them. Where it's a little a little more hinky to do that with the all the stuff in the cookies. So um, I don't know that it would have really changed the answer. Like I really wanted people to have a seamless experience. It kind of seemed rude to me to like, oh, we upgraded, so you need to log in again. I, I, I just, I don't like that. So uh, that was worth, worth the effort for my perspective. And for a lot of our users, they're not, they're not full, the kiosk monitor. So if we would have shifted it to just like log everybody out, not only have to log on your machine, you have to go find like credentials right. to that kiosk machine. Figure out how to remote into it. Yep. It's a real hassle, and then people get blindness into their system. Facebook actually probably easier, right? Like, yeah, I don't want to see a lot of my thing, it's a big deal. For us, it's a lot more effort. All right. Thank you, everybody.